It's that boy Fred, host of FanView Podcast. Tune in to the NOTN app. We days, 3.30 for the FanView Podcast. Go to NewOrleansTalkNetwork.com to watch more episodes of FanView Podcast. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and watch. Hi, everybody. My name is Tyrone Mitchell. I'm social head coach here at Xavier University here in New Orleans, and you're watching FanView Podcast. Check it out. They say this year's draft is probably the worst draft. Mm-hmm. Um, but John Lucas will speak out on it because he's a guy that, you know, that all. around them kids. Right, Rico man. Rico Hines, Bo Williams. Yeah. And he up front. And he go tell the truth. And their respect is mine. Um, I just think, man, you know, they got to come together. Um, you know, we, we could talk about, you know, the Europeans all day long. But like you say, if the leaders ain't talking about it, mm-hmm. which I think it will come out soon. Uh, right after the draft. Yep. If not this one, the next one. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Fan View Podcast. It's your boy G Sports. Coach Hurricane here back at it again. And again and again and again. We we back at it, man. Uh got a special friend in the building, Xavier Associate Head Coach Tyrone Mitchell. Uh good friend of mine, man. Been been knowing you were probably about a good six, seven, eight years. I never forget when I first built a re- was able to build a relationship with you, man. You came recruit a kid from my hometown and my alma mater, Ray Sean Mart, who ended up being an all American at Xavier, but we'll get into all of that. Yep. Uh Everybody that's watching, man, make sure you follow the, the Fan View Live page on Facebook, uh, Instagram, TikTok. Make sure you follow your boy G Sports. I'm at 24,000 subscribers, man. I'm trying to get to 25K, man. Help your boy out. Help your boy Help out. Help your boy out, man. <laughs> Help your boy out, man. But uh, Coach Mitch, man, we we always like to start our podcast off, uh, bro, uh, talking about your journey. Man, take me back and take the viewers back to when you grew up in New Iberia, Um and 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 when did you fall in love with the game of basketball? And how did the game of basketball get you to where you at the day? You know, one of the most uh, highly touted coaches in the state of Louisiana, winning conference championships, molding young men, turning them into all Americans, were they able to go into the to the the next chapter of their life and be successful young men, man? Oh man! First of all, I want to say thank y'all, man, for having me on. Um, I mean, none of this was possible, man, without God. Um, and man, that's first and foremost. Um, growing up, man, in New Iberia, it was a, I don't know, man, it was a challenge, just like everywhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, didn't really get no identity um, until I started getting my respect. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know how that go, you know, in the neighborhoods, you know, once you get your respect, you gain your identity. Right. Um, you know, growing up in New Iberia is not really a big outlet. Right. Um, you know, it's a football town. Um, not too many guys that play basketball made it out. Um, I think I'm one of the few. But um, growing up, man, you know, normal childhood, um, raised in a home where, you know, it was rough. You know, mama worked hard. Um, so I always looked at that and tried to use basketball as my motivational tool. Um, that's all I remember was people saying, you know, if you play basketball well, you get a scholarship. That's all I was worrying about. I wasn't worrying about where I went. Who I went to, I was just worrying about getting the scholarship. Yeah. Free ninety nine. Free ninety nine, man. <laughs> and um, you know, started playing at Anderson Middle School. Where really before that, I'm gonna just take you back. You know, in New Iberia, I was a, take us back, man. Yeah, man, New Iberia. Starting out, man, seven or eight years old. I think I scored sixty four points in a bitty basketball game. Oh, oh Lord. Yeah, man, and I think they still have that up in the Martin Luther King Center at New Iberia right now. Um. Didn't really know it at the time. I didn't. Um, still didn't hit me. I was just playing with my friends. Um, so it went from there to playing AU, uh, playing against some really good competition. Then he went to middle school. In middle school, I started in the seventh grade for Anderson Middle School, which was unheard of. Yep. Um, Especially back then. Yeah. If you start in the seventh grade over eighth graders, you had something going on. Um, so... Went there, man, and and um and um did a great job, and uh, under Coach Fondal, who's 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 like highly respected, 
Uh, one of the best middle school coaches, one of the best coaches I played for, period. Uh, taught me discipline, time management, uh, and that's what, something that I always respect him for. Um, growing up in New Iberia, man, I had two younger brothers. Um, grew up in a rough neighborhood. Uh, you know, and it still carried with me till the day. I'm a guy that I always observed the room. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm always watching the watches. Um, and I'm always, you know, I'm always a real dude. What you see is what you go get. Um, if you want to talk about life, we could talk about life. But that's what I was taught, man, in New Iberia. Just always be up front with people. You know, and deal with, with the rest, you know, on the back end. But um grew up with two younger brothers. Um they didn't they didn't play sports, you know, we was almost a product of our environment. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna say that, G. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, I could talk about that more and more because, you know, my life is man, it's really like I don't know, man, it's like a movie. I'm gonna be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know how much more you want me to get deep into it. Man, we, you know, we always just like to get people uh, insight on what molded you into who you are today because the Tyrone Mitchell we see today wasn't probably the Tyrone Mitchell we seen back in Anderson Middle. Oh, and, and, you know, just kind of touch on like what the trials and tribulations you went through, man, that got you to, to be the person you are. Okay. Because um, everybody posting their success, nobody posting their failures, though. Yes. Yes. And that's the God honest truth. Gee, um, well, I went to middle school, man. Half of the guys that I went to middle school with right now, either in jail for murder or probably in jail for armed robbery or dead. Um, and this is a fact. Um, so I went to guys, you know, I went to school with guys that really was talented but didn't make it to the next level, which is high school. Um, they didn't take the academic piece seriously. Me neither. Um, so moved on to ninth grade. Ninth grade year. We had a talented freshman team. At the time, it was New Iberia Freshman High. Mm-hmm. Um, we just had a freshman school. Um, had a lot of talent, man. So playing playing in freshman high, I actually got a chance to go play with the 10th and 11th and 12th graders. So I'm like, well, man, maybe I have something. You know, everybody talking, and everybody know my nickname is Tucci. Right. So, <laughs> you know, not too many people know me as Tyrone Mitchell. Everybody know me as Tucci. Mm-hmm. So... Um, you know, that that was a big piece for me going into my eighth grade summer to my ninth grade year because I was actually playing against guys from other middle schools. So now we was one school. I had guys from Bell Place, mm-hmm. had guys from my Berry Middle. So now we're all one team and it was like a big beef thing. You know, where I'm better than you. Well, Territorial. Yep. So coach had to fi- coach had to figure out how to get all these guys into one team. These guys from one end of New Iberia, they're from a different part of New Iberia. They don't like each other. There's so much going on. So to make a long story short, I wind up standing out, played there, did well. Uh, we wind up beating the JV team for New Iberia Senior High because at the time we only had two high schools. We had Cali High New Iberia and New Iberia Senior High. So there wasn't there wasn't any – Westgate wasn't a no. school back then? Well, Westgate was freshman high. Okay, didn't know that. So they took freshman high and made Westgate. Um, so Westgate is considered the uptown kids. Gotcha. So Westgate, you know, so many kids are so good there because they're free to school for all three projects. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. In Liberia. So it's, it's so many athletes. For real. So many athletes, man. You could man, you could just pick them off the streets, man. There's so many athletes. Um, but the guidance wasn't there. But now the guidance is there. Now you can see what it's doing. Um, you know, for Westgate. But um, so wind up going to New Iberia freshman high. I start falling off with my grades, man. I'm going to be honest. You know, I started getting off into other things, um, which was normal for me in my neighborhood. You know, all my friends, you know, was coming to school with thousands of dollars. And um, with me seeing that, you know, I wanted to make a thousand dollars. So, you know, I'm... You know, you know, I started following the trend, and that's why I was saying I was almost a product of my environment. So what changed my life was my ninth grade summer. My ninth grade summer, I almost got shot in the head. Mm. So I, I pushed the gun just in time. It grazed me on the chest. I'm going to make you laugh, G, because two weeks later, I had a national AAU tournament to go to. <laughs> and I didn't want to tell my AAU coaches, who was Chris Poulard, not assistant coach at David Thibodeau, 
uh, Mr. Nolan Hamilton, and the late um, David Thibodeau, who's well known in the Lafayette, New Iberia area, Baron Ridge area. Um, some kind of way they found out, and uh, that's when it started making sense to me. Because, you know, being a product of your environment, when something like that happens behind a robbery, you got to take care of your business. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was almost to that level. And thank God I didn't do that. Um, so that led to me going to my sophomore year. Sophomore year, man, joking around with my grades, I wound up being ineligible. Damn. I didn't play at all. Played AAU that summer very well. Everybody was like, why you didn't play high school? Then my AU coach was like, man, he don't want to focus on his grades. I know that was embarrassing. Man, that was embarrassing, man. Yeah. That was embarrassing. Um, you know, man, my dad was a street guy, so, you know, that wasn't on his radar. Mm -hmm. My mom worked hard, so the only thing my mom knew, I was just playing basketball. I was staying out of trouble. But one thing about it, even though I was almost a product of my environment, I always had values. Mm -hmm. um, always respected people. I always worked hard with basketball. Always. I didn't let that slack. Um, so, you know, going into that, you know, after that, my 11th grade year, uh, I had summer school, my 10th grade summer. My 11th grade year, I, I wind up playing. My only year of high school ball, man, we went to the top 28. <laughs> went to the top 28. I was MVP of the area. I was all state. Um, and that was it, man. I mean, I was all, I mean, all kind of stuff. But that was the year St. Aug, St. Aug won it. They beat Saul LaFouche mm -hmm. in the state championship. Um, I think Hollis and Quanis was on that team. We lost to St. Aug in the top 20 in the final four. <coughs> Um, but that was my only full year playing basketball. Um, for his varsity, as far as, yeah, for his varsity, you know, not everybody know that. So after that, man, my AAU coaches, man, we went to nationals. We wound up playing well, man. Me, Darren Mitchell, Josh Thibodeau, uh, man, we had all D1 guys. Um, and Jermaine Spencer, mm -hmm. was number one player in the state at the time, he committed to LSU. Um, we wind up going to nationals. So the word got out that I had the academic problem. So um, my AAU coaches wind up meeting a guy from a prep school. Uh, the guy from the prep school was like, man, we'll take him. And I ain't never heard of prep school. <laughs> right. Uh, so when I got home, they called my mom before I got home. My mom was like, you going? And I'm like, mom, I promise you, I'm gonna get my grades and you just let me stay in New Iberia. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> So, and usually the mama don't want their baby to lead in this. That's true, man. That's true, man. Man, I cried. I'm gonna be honest, man, I cried. And uh, but that decision wind up changing my life forever. Um, wind up going to prep school, play well. We won the Taps Championship in Texas. Man, I was all tournament teams with guys like Andre. Owens or Andre Emmett, the one that passed away. Yeah, that went to Texas Tech. Texas Tech. Yeah, he was real good. He played for Bobby Knight. He played for Bobby Knight. He was real good. Emmett. Um, wind up going there, man. I mean, I did well, man. I'm going to be honest. I did well at the prep school. I did so well that they just wanted kids from Louisiana. Um, wind up going there, gee, I'm a funny story. Played football, and I used to play football too. Um, went there, played football, man, and actually got some interest from Texas a &M. Come on. Man, it was crazy. What position sport, you was man. playing? Man, punt returner, wide I, you, receiver. I, I see that twitchiness in you. Like, yeah. I can see you, yeah. Cornerback. Making people miss. Safe miss. That's what it was. <laughs> so they used to call me water. So oh. I had a coach. So, so, so my head coach was, um, oh, man. Man, they going to kill me for not remembering this guy, football coach. But his son wound up going, going to Wake Forest. For, and he, um, he was a quarterback because he went to the public school, Harlingen, Harlingen South, there in Harlingen, Texas. Coach Martin. Coach Martin, man, wound up playing with the Falcons. So, man, he knew a lot of people. And this was an all-boy military school. Went there, did well, <clears> got my <throat> grades, um, played there, man. Played under Coach Jones, great coach. Now he's a high school coach in Lufkin, Texas. Uh, just a real good dude, man. Talked to him this morning, actually. Um, just a great guy, man. Help, help me, man. Saved my life, actually. Saved my life. Uh, and ever since then, man, I ain't looked back. Wind up signing with Northwestern State. Mm -hmm. 
had some other offers, but, you know, I want to be closer to home. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was 10 hours away from home. I was South Texas and uh, signed with Northwestern State. And, man, the rest is history. Do you Damn. think going to that prep school helped prepare you for college? Because that's the biggest – for structure that's the, and that's the biggest hurdle that most kids have that that's their first time away from home so about right. you going to prep school in a whole nother state it did so i would think you know that made that that freshman year of college like transition just seamless oh man i was like a fish out of water because you imagine a kid from new iberia louisiana going to an all-boy prep school I mean, you're waking up at 5.30 in the morning. Mm. You're running three miles. You got you got homework check. You know, you got guys that's in the ninth grade telling you what to do because they're higher you ranked than you. Huh. You got to clean your shoes. You got to make your bed. You know, you got to stand in a single file line while you eat your food or you're preparing to get your food. But all those things taught me discipline. Um, you know, it taught me how to be patient also. Um, you know, I was a kid. I, I didn't have a dime. I went there, man, and those people gave me $75 a week. And I went to school with all millionaires. You know, that school cost it 40 some thousand to go there a year. And mm. it's still running till today. Um, so I went to school with all millionaires. And, you know, you know, while I went there, I wound up, you know, making connections with really good dudes. Dudes that work as, I don't know, business owners. Uh, Merrill Lynch, man, his son mm. went to the school. Mm. Um mm. Um, I go on and on, man. Man, my roommate name was David Sanchez. I can't find him, so if you ever see this, man, I hope he called me. He was from Boston. Um, so he wound up going to Texas Tech as a walk-on, as quarterback, I believe quarterback. And, um, man, one weekend he took me to his grandparents' house in Brownsville, Texas. Man, look, let me tell you, I didn't want to go. I'm like, man, I don't want to go over there, man. You know, I don't, mm -hmm. you know, you know, that ain't my speed. Right. I wind up going over there, man, and I just saw a whole different view of life. Man, his grandmother then was rich. Man, he had a uh, they had a ranch where they found all on a ranch. Uh, I forget the running back for the Cowboys back in the days. Uh, Not Tony Dorsett. Tony Dorsett used to go hunt wild hogs on a ranch. I didn't even know who Tony Dorsett was. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we used to go to South Padre Island, man. We had a condo. We had every new car you could think of. His grandmother gave us cars, man, to go to dealers and shop. I never brought Nautica in my life. I, used to, man, man, that's what Nautica was. The, Nautica. The, the, the top <laughs> thing in the world back then. Man. So yes, yeah, man. That Boy, changed you my some memory right there. <laughs> that Nautica. So that changed my, my life, man. My journey is definitely, man, a journey, man. That man. Sometimes I look back and I'm, you know, sometimes, man, I amaze myself. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why, you know, man, when I recruit kids, you know, I'm always close to them, uh, you know, because there's stories that I hear that always bring me back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether you came from a single parent home, you know, man, whether your dad in the streets, you know, whether you came from a, you know, you know, a, you know, a marriage household, you know, I could relate to that also. Um, but man, it's been a journey. It's been a journey, man. Uh Take me back to your Northwestern days, man. Uh, you was a part of a program where y'all had an opportunity to play in a tournament, upset at Iowa. You always posed that wrong March Madness time when y'all upset them. Um, and you was – y'all had a game winning shot to win the game, if I'm correct, right? That's right. And uh, I thought that's a hell of an experience for anybody, especially coming from a Southland Conference, small school like Northwestern State. Uh, but take me through your college experience, man, and because – you was a scorer right. coming out of high school. And and, and I really want to dive into this because a lot of kids don't understand that just because you might be the leading scorer on your team in high school, when you get to college, your role might change. Your role was different in Northwestern State. Played a big impact in the team's success, but you wasn't asked to be a high-level scorer. But right. you still was able to play a big role into y'all making it to the tournament and beating a team like Iowa. Man, take me back to – that experience at Northwestern State and how you was able to have a big impact on the team, but it your role kind of changed. Man, I'm gonna make y'all laugh. That's how much I was out the loop, really. Like, I just love basketball. 
my prep school coach came in the office my last year and gave me a McDonald's All American plaque. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Coach, what's this? He was like, Well, you made the second cut, but you didn't make the the last cut or something like that. So they gave me a like a plaque with my name on it, McDonald's All American. And I'm like, man, I didn't know nothing about this. You know, I'm like, well, I don't know, you know, G, I'm just playing. Right. So I go to Northwestern. So we go work out. And I'm there, man, at that time. I'm just, you know, I'm a score. I'm talking about 20 off 20. Right. I'll give you 20 like that. You know, jumping, lobs, all that. You know, when I went to the prep school, my jumping ability went from average to, you know, high. Now, I don't know how because I used to run with strength shoes every day. Yeah. <laughs> so I go to Northwestern, and, you know, I'm like, here. I ain't going to lie. They got good guys, but I'm like, here. Mm -hmm. So... And I always took winning serious. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, coach, man, all I do is, man, look, coach, everywhere I go, man, I win. Like, I don't care what it is. Like, I want to win. So me and Coach Les, who was the former head coach at UNO, mm -hmm. you know, Coach Les was recruiting me. He wound up taking over for um, Coach Buzz that's at Texas A&M right now. Mm -hmm. So Coach Buzz was recruiting me first. He wound up getting a job somewhere, I think, UNO. Mm -hmm. And then Coach Les took over, and um, and that's how I went to Northwestern State. But going there, you know, I was sizing everybody up because I, you know, you know, in my mind, you know, I was thankful for the opportunity, but I always felt I was better than that. Yep. And um, but I always say, man, look, be where your feet are. Mm -hmm. So when I went there, I think I was the leading scorer my freshman year, the first seven games, my first game against New Mexico State. I mean, I mean the uh, Lobos, uh -huh. New Mexico. New Mexico uh -huh. State. That a guy named Ruben Douglas. He led the nation in scoring. He averaged like thirty points a game. But my first game, I think I had like twenty four points. My first collegiate game, huh. and I'm like, man, I'm about to, I'm about to kill it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, and you know, that's in my mind. And we wound up losing fifty four to fifty. We had the youngest team in college basketball. We had all freshmen. Um, you know, Dicky V gave us a shout out against. North Carolina. It was a Duke, North Carolina game. So, you know, to answer G question, Coach Mike called me in the office and he said, Tyrone, if you lead us in scoring, we ain't going to never win a game. Mm. And I'm like, what? I'm like, man, I'm out of here. I'm like, no, this ain't for me. So I called Coach Poulard, who was my AAU coach. You know, they had a big influence on me, mm -hmm. you know, choosing schools. Mm -hmm. And I said, Coach Poulard, this is not the place for me. And he said, man, just hang in there. So, you know, shout out to Coach Poulard, man. Um, Coach Scotty Burrell. Um, but Coach Poulard really made me focus. And um, he said, man, just lead this team, man. Lead them. So I went from a scorer to a pure point guard. Mm -hmm. Every day, man, just, just leading, just leading. And that's just my natural ability. You know, I'm the oldest of three. Mm -hmm. You know, I know how to make sacrifices. I'm just always leading. You know, it's just a natural thing to me. And um, <clears throat> went there, man. You know, I accepted my role. You know, I went from a 20-point score in prep school to seven-point score in college. Right. Five assists, six assists. Super sacrifice. But I only played 20 minutes a game. You know, we did five in, five out. But it worked. And um, but I never forget, man, we was, man, was about to play Iowa. And Coach Les said, uh, man, we playing Iowa, man. They got Jeff Horner and these other dudes and, you know, a Big Ten player of the year. You know, the guard that I was going was Big Ten player of the year. So I'm like, Coach, man, they put their shoes on like us. I said, man, I'm a winner. Right. I don't know about nobody else in this room, but I'm a winner. Since I stepped foot on Northwestern State campus, <laughs> we won. So I, that's all I know how to do. And I'm infectious, man. Right. So <laughs> if you don't want to win, just don't even be it. Don't put Tyrone in. <laughs> that, so, I mean, that's just the mindset I always have. You know, and I always tell people, man, they tie these shoes like you. You know, you, you just got to outwork them. So, man, we wind up we wind up winning that game. Man, that stuff changed my life, man. Coach Mike changed lives for coaches. You know, Coach Simmons went on, who's my assistant coach to be, you know, the head coach at Magnese. Coach Les went on to be the head coach at UNO. Mm -hmm. Coach Mike wound up getting a huge contract. You know, you know, he got his name on the court now. That team changed a lot of lives. 
change the ton of negatives. Um, so you know that that's that's one of the things G, you know, I had to sacrifice, I had to be humble, um, you know, to help that team win. Cause I ain't do it by myself. You know, I had teammates, Byron Allen. Clifton Lee, uh -huh. and your man Wallace, you know, the guy that hit the shot. Um, Keenan Jones, a guy who rest his soul, one of the best guards I ever played against. Luke Rogers, um, you know, guys that people don't really know that was really good ball players. Uh, Kerwin Forges, not a head uh -huh. coach at Douglas. Uh -huh. Man, one of my good friends. Uh -huh. I played against Kerwin. Yep. And your man Spencer, big time, big time athlete, man. Um, so we had a team, man. We had a team with the guys that understood the sacrifice of winning. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it will be another team like that in no Western state history, unless I'm the head coach. But, <laughs> but, um, but, but you know, it was a lot of sacrificing. I'm going to say that, man. Taught me a lot too, man, on and off the floor. I think that's important to touch on. That's why I asked you that question, because in this day and age, and, and, Coach, and Mitch, you know, you know, so many kids think it's about Scoring, 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 scoring. Stat sheet. And they don't understand how team success brings individual success. That's right. And just like you just said, look how many opportunities everybody got. From that. From the team success. And I think that's why I kind of wanted to touch on your sacrifice because I knew you was a scorer. But, and shout out to your AAU coach for making you stick it through. Right and and figure it out and do it the right way, bro. And you know, man, it's it's a you're right, man. That team success, man, it brought a lot of individual success. Um, man, I average for my career. I don't know, G. You might want to check. I forgot. You know, I was the all-time steals leader. Mm -hmm. I think I was third in assists or second in assists mm -hmm. now. And you, they named you like in the Fab Fifty or something like that in Northwestern history. In Northwestern history, top That's big, bro. Like to be in the top. Fifth in a in a school history? Come on, man. Of all, yeah. Come on, man. And um and on average, I think I think it was nine and six, you know, or maybe seven and six, you know, for my career. Mm -hmm. But um, man, like G said, you know, I went on and played almost nine years in year mm -hmm. for, from those stats. So the only thing I needed was a chance. Um, so we wind up having five guys, man, go overseas and play. Um, I'm talking about some legit leagues. Um you played in Europe. That's the best of the best. Yeah, man. That's yeah. where everybody's trying to get to when they get over there. And it's unheard of, man, to average, you know, man, what I average. And to get that shot. And to get that chance. And, um, you know, we were signing with some good agencies, man. And, and like G said, man, that team success just opened so many doors. You know, and kids out there, man, if you're watching this, um, you know, own what you do. Um, you know, if you get to college, man, and they want you to be the best defender, be that. Yep. You know, shout out to Squeaky. Mm -hmm. You know, you Squeaky know, Johnson? Squeaky man, Squeaky <laughs> from New Orleans, man, great defender. You know, I used to watch him, man, in college. Um, you know, just always on this role, and that took him. You know, that put him through doors he could never imagine. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, man, it's all about sacrificing. You know, it's not about scoring, and I want high school coaches to know that. You know, you know, when you're evaluating your own kid, you know, you know, man, just be honest with him. Yep. You know, if you're a great defender, then, man, let him own that. You know, if you're a great scorer, then let him own that. Because, you know, as college coaches, um, you know, when we get the kid and you say X, Y, and Z, if he not that, then, you know, we kind of stuck with that. Yeah. Um, and then we trust your evaluation also. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I always tell G, man, if, if you see me in the gym, I'm there for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, and I know a lot of college coaches work hard. They work hard. G work hard. You work hard. Um, you know, but, I, you know, it take me a good while to really be sold on a kid. And I'll be honest, and sometimes that hurt me, you know, because I'm a straightforward dude. That might hurt me in this business. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, I've been at Xavier 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I know I have an eye for, for talent. Definitely. And, and, and I can coach. But, you know, I'm just humble. I'm not going to knock nobody out the way to get where I got to get. Uh, you know, man, when God says, you know, man, it's my time to move on, then I'm move on throughout his blessings. You know? I got a question for you. And, it, like, it just it came came up to me um, just, just to listen to the journey, especially that last piece when G was asking you about the, um, like, how you had to transition roles uh, when you was at Northwestern. And, you know, the finals just ended. Yep. And... It 
it's crazy to me how the last – well, it's not crazy because we all coach, so we understand this. And I don't understand why the league hasn't caught on to this. The last three champions were all program franchise mindset by that. They built through the draft. The coaching staff didn't change from – Change much They might have added One or two pieces But it was Homegrown mm-hmm. Done in a, Done in the um, Done the right way In you know, hopes built, You know what I'm saying Doing the program Why do you think It's taking the league So long To follow that mindset That the college coaches Drive on Because You know it's, You know There's big time money involved um, You know The politics of that you know, money rules everything. Like, I, you know, if, if you have a GM, you know, and you and him don't see eye to eye, you know, and he have a friend that's making less money than the head coach that's capable of being a head coach, they don't mind making that move. That's why there's so much change going on in the league. But to speak on what you're speaking on, those top teams are all culture teams. You know, the Lakers are, you know, you know that's cultivated. That's been through the 80s, the 70s. You know, you know the Celtics. You know that's culture. Mm-hmm. You know, eighteen championships. You know, so when you look at those squads, man, you know they ain't really moving too many pieces, right? You know, because they believe in their culture, and they believe that their household name. You know, now when you get your Milwaukee Bucks, you know, you know that's kind of like lightning striking. You know, once every once in a while, but they could be the same way. But it's so much change. You know, it's, you know we spoke on Coach Griffin. Mm-hmm. You know, he was doing a great job. But somewhere down the line, they didn't see eye to eye, so they made the change for Doc Rivers. So now that set that team back yep. maybe one or two years. Yep. Easy. So, you know, you know, when you got money involved, you know, especially in those high places, you know, man, it's just so hard to, you know, to have loyalty. Um, you know, because guys ain't, you know, if it ain't about basketball, then what is it about? Mm-hmm. And, see, that, and, and to me, that, I think that's the – that's the big thing. That's the biggest uh, for me. I think that's the biggest draw from football to basketball because there's so many people in, on football. So like everybody's not gonna get that big check that's on the team. So you might have three, four like high paid kids. Everybody else is that like like it's a job, but like they love this. Like right. you might have a practice squad guy. Like hey, look, I I'm, I love coming here just is, is doing this. The NBA don't have that much roster space right. for that, and I think what's gotten in the way, and I think you hit it, you hit on it, was the ego and the money has outweighed the fundamental and the love of the game. Because right. if you get, because you get somebody like Dame, and I'm not saying like I don't, I'm not saying that Dame don't love the game, but Milwaukee, I felt like set themselves back when you had Drew, who was just. Like you said, I'm a star. A I'm a star in my role. I I, I'm a all defense. Boom, boom. I could always score, but they don't. I don't. Why? Why go score when I got this around me? But if they not, if they not eating, I didn't tow you up on defense. You don't have the energy. You can't stay with me now. Now, now the twenty I look, I give you gonna look like forty. Right. You know, and. And I think like that's the the everybody's looking for the 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 shiny thing and forget that without the metal, it, right. it, it doesn't do nothing. Well, I'm gonna tell you this: we we seen it right now. I know G know it, and you know a lot of qualified coaches in the NBA. G had texted me right before this interview mm-hmm. about Jason Tatum and top five dudes in the league. It start from the top. You got a guy like JJ Reddick. Ain't never coached a day in his life. So, so in the player's eyes, you know, like where's the loyalty? So now you like, man, I'm, man, it's a business. I'm gonna do what I gotta do to get what I gotta get. Mm-hmm. I'm out of here. Mm-hmm. So, so you see the loyalty with the Celtics now because it was a point in time where they had to make a decision on Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. Mm-hmm. But the loyalty came in where Brad Stevens said, man, we're going to sign both of them. And we're going to go get Drew Holiday, who is a winner, mm-hmm. who, but who's very humble, to show them how to win a championship. Now, they might not say that 
But that's why they brought Drew Holiday there. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, Brad Stevens is a real mastermind, man. Um, you know, you know, coaching and, you know, getting guys to buy in and, you know, seeing his vision. But that's where the loyalty come in to answer your question. And how humble of it, how humble was it for Brad Stevens to say, let me step away from the sideline and go in the front office and just orchestrate and put a team together, right? The, the and, and I think thing. that was big. And to, to piggyback on the whole Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum thing, when it was up 3-1, mm -hmm. or it might have been 3 nothing, and Shaq told Jalen Brown in the post uh, the post game interview, he said, don't let the media and don't let everybody come between what you and Jason Tatum trying to accomplish about who team this is. You the better player. He the better player. Don't let that get in the way of y'all winning the championship. He said, because that messed me up when I was young with Penny Hardaway. Right? It could have been special. Yeah, because there's no reason in the world why <laughs> – Penny Hardaway and Shaq shouldn't have won at least one. Oh, with Nick, at least with, one. With Nick Scott, did, yeah. with Dennis Scott, oh, man. Nick Anderson, yeah. Like, yeah. Horace Grant. Yeah. Yeah. It was ready. Yeah. It was ready, man. Um, but I do want to I do want to talk about the, the Xavier basketball program, bro. Uh nice. we had Coach AJ on here and, and he gave his perspective on how y'all was able to build something special over there. But I I I want to get your perspective on what y'all been able to do over these last nine years. I, I think it's been remarkable, bro. Uh so many All Americans, a ton of conference championships, made a run in the national tournament, uh, and also building young men. How have y'all been able to get Xavier to where it's at today? Man, Coach AJ, man, me and him work well together, man. When you work well with someone, it, it just, you know, it shows. Um, I think we totally opposite, but, but we mesh so well together. You know, I'm more defensive-minded, and um, Coach A.J. is really offensive-minded. He's a – man, the X's and O's, man, he's one of the best guys I've been around. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about he's a student of the game offensively. Very good, man. Just break down stuff, you know, to where, man, you can't miss it. And, um, you know, man, he believe in me. You know, man, he know my strengths. And, um, and I always told him, I say, look, man, we're going to win a national championship with Louisiana kids. That's big with me. And you know, not wrong, you know, we not going wrong without a state. Kids, but the Louisiana kids, we just got a different mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, straight dogs, you know, starting with Ray Sean Mark, mm -hmm. uh, William Lord, yep. um, kid from Baton Rouge, Ray Sean is from um home, great, with the HL Bourgeois High School. The foundation. Um, you know, Makai Richard from from Morgan City. You know, those guys have household names in this mm -hmm. city. Uh, started as young kids just coming to Xavier. You know, you know, those guys led us to championships. And, you know, Coach AJ always say, T, hey, man, look, man, go out there and find us something. And, you know, man, so I go out there, man, and I just do my strengths. You know, I look for kids in Louisiana that I know that come from a great background, play hard, you know, don't mind working, uh, you know, and just hungry, man. Um, and, and that led to even T.J. Jones. Yep. Um, kid Life from Life Christian. Life Christian, like five nine, nobody believed in him. Came to Xavier, man. He the all time winningest player in Xavier, Xavier history. Started all his years. Um, just a great point guard, mm -hmm. man, just a pure winner. He won four state championships in high school. Came to Xavier, and won three conference championships. <laughs> just a straight winner, man. And um, you know we did that with Louisiana kids. You know with the support of some out of state kids, but you know the majority of our kids was Louisiana kids. And that's where our culture was bred it. And, uh, man, AJ just did a great – man, he's still doing a great job. Um, and, and I really believe, man, we right there to making a run at a national championship. Um, and no disrespect to no universities in this state. Mm -hmm. you know, But I just think Xavier have a legit chance every year to win a national championship. No doubt. Um, you know, they have some great programs. They got some great coaches in this state, guys that work hard. You know, I'm friends with a lot of them. Um, you know, but, you know, at our level, I think every year Xavier have a chance to make a run at a national championship. And we right there. You know, we just got to, you know, keep on working and, and uh, you know, keep on getting kids, you know, from this area. Um, you know, and I know that's something that you want to talk on, mm -hmm. you know, kids from the New Orleans area. Mm -hmm. 
you know, but you know, that's what we're trying to do, man. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to do that as Xavier, man. And man, we built that from the ground up, man. You know, with hard work, you know, with guys out of the backyard. Uh, and, you know, man, I really think, you know, Coach Williams given a chance as a Division One coach. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I really believe that. Um, you know, I've seen it with my own two eyes. You know, it's just, you know, preparation got to meet opportunity. Yep. Um, and, and, and it'll happen sooner or later. So uh, we just got to keep working until then. But how, because I always like to ask, I always like to know and pick coaches' brains when you get to a program and it's not the standard. How did y'all make it the standard in such a short, a short amount of time? I'm not talking about in year nine, year 10. I'm talking about in two, three. Yeah, in two and three. Like y'all first year, I think y'all, wait, y'all was 500, close to 500 or something like that? Man, we won 10 games our first year. And then the second year, it was like a, yeah, we, yeah, we won like 18. A 360, bro. 18, so 19. what what did y'all do in that short amount of time as coaches to turn that program around? And I think a lot of people that, that watch our podcast, they need those nuggets. Right. Well, one thing we did, man, we laid our foundation, man, just about defense. Um, you know, you know, a lot of schools, you know, they prepare or they practice an hour and 15 minutes on offense. Mm. So we flipped it. So we said, if we can't score, man, we gonna stop you. So the score could be 10 to four, but we gonna win. Right. So we gonna emphasize defense every day. And if you go look at our games, man, we emphasize we're a defensive minded team. Um, some years we were better than others. I mean, better than other years, you know, de defensively. But once we start doing that, you know, we start seeing, you know, winning seasons, championships, guys start buying in. You know, man, we start scoring the ball easier, you know, with transition points, defense creating offense. Um, then we got guys to buy in. Guys start being defensive dogs, taking it personal, um, getting guys that was defensive player year in the conference. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Rayshon Mart, man, just a man, just a dog, mm -hmm. defensive dog, man, probably the best player in Xavier history. I'm serious. Rayshon Mart is probably the best player in Xavier history. Two time All American, or three time. Two time first team All American. All American. Didn't play the second half of his senior year. He needed three games to be the all time leading scorer. Yep. The best player in Xavier history, and that speak volumes. Mm -hmm. They have some really good players come out of Xavier. And you're talking about a kid from HL Bourgeois that was real lanky, couldn't talk, mm -hmm. couldn't talk or tie his shoes at the same time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you see him today, man, he a monster. Yep. Um, I really think Rayshon Mark can make an NBA roster. Six four point guard. Mm -hmm. Jump out the gym, dog, long arms, but guys like that brought the program to another level. And uh, he started as a freshman, uh, and that's what took the program from mediocre, mm -hmm. you know, to pass average, should I say. Mm -hmm. How hard is it to recruit in this state knowing that football is number one and so well I guess I guess the better way to ask the question when you know like football is the breadwinner of the state and that's just the south in, in, in general then get your top tier guys that might be like maybe 10 on down on the list are like dual sport athletes and they looking at they looking at scholarship off of like, man, I could go pay for football at La Tech or possibly basketball at Xavier. Mm -hmm. Try especially how we convince them. Yeah, you know, like like, it, like especially in the early on now, like the stand like like geez, like like the standards standard. Right. You know what I'm saying? It, that's not a it's not a hard argument, but especially going through that journey in the beginning, like how was that? Oh man, it was tough. You know, man, it was tough. Nobody. You know, every kid dream is to play Division One basketball. Okay. So, so when you're approaching a kid, man, you're recruiting a kid. You got to make him understand your vision, but it's not really your vision because it's really his. But you got to put it where, look, man, if you come here, we gonna make sure that we take care of you. We gonna make sure that you graduate, 
and we're going to make sure you grow to be the best basketball player you could be or student athlete, right? Because when you come to Xavier, it's all about being a student athlete. We have a 95 percentile graduation rate, right? And we ain't talking about no knocks to no degrees, but we talking about high level degrees. <laughs> um, you know, we talking about putting people in the world, you know, you know that go change lives. Um, you know, Ray Sean Mark was a chemistry pre form major. Uh, you know, that's not your everyday student athlete. Right. Uh, so, you know, when we going against that, you know, that's a pitch also. You know, I always tell them, man, when you leave here, you will be ready for the world. Um, you know, you have teammates that will be doctors, lawyers, business owners, um, leaders in this world. Uh, coming here, you're going to win. You know, man, you're going to graduate. That's more important to me than anything. Beautiful woman. Right, beautiful women. <laughs> you know, you gonna wind up meeting your wife here. Yeah, she will be a doctor, and then you know, just the educational piece that I take serious because I was almost, you know, a guy that was a product of his environment. Yeah. So I'll hold you high to that. You know, I tell your parents first and foremost, if he not here serious about his academics, he ain't gonna make it here, and I'm gonna be calling you to pick him up. So that's why we have, and I just meet Coach Williams also. That's why we have a 95 percentile graduation rate. And we talking about kids that look like us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that people don't think that's smart enough. Or, you know, I'm going to just take for instance, you know, and Makai Richard, you know, he's on pace to get his degree, a business degree. So once you get that degree, and Makai is a leader, mm -hmm. he'll go back to Morgan City and change lives. Yep. You know, so now that's, you know, that's a big thing for us. You know, and not saying that we don't recruit, you know, other races or other ethnic backgrounds, but, you know, Xavier's an HBCU school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't, you know, the guys that we recruit is the guys that we recruit. Mm -hmm. uh, we would love to recruit more guys in the city. We we would love that. You know, that's another subject for another time. Right. <laughs> you know, shout out to all the coaches in New Orleans, man. Much love from Xavier. Uh, but, you know, that's how we get kids to buy in. You know, we sell kids on the educational piece, um, you know, on the basketball piece. You know, it's a win-win situation. So, I think you have one of the best basketball minds uh, that I've came across. That's why I text you about, you know, the Jason Tatum topic and, and things like that. When I see you in the gym, we always running it about different situations, whether it's a kid, evaluating, whatever it is. But what I want to know is, Coach, <clears throat> When does a coach know that he's ready to be a head coach of a program? Oh, man. G, G put me on the spot. When do, <laughs> when, when do you know? You know, because some coaches I hear, man, I think I'm ready. I, I feel like I'm ready. And then you got other coaches I talk to, they be like, man, I don't know if I'm ready. They kind of be doubting it. So when does a coach know that they're ready? I mean, when the opportunity is ready. You know, I, I had two. I, I, I had some opportunities. Um, just had one recently. Um, it just ain't work out, you know. It didn't, should I say, great opportunity, but it but it didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Um, you you know you're ready when things just second nature to you. Mm -hmm. You know the recruiting piece, you know the admissions piece. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know making sure the kid is you know is well, good with the transition coming into school, mm -hmm. practice planning, uh, travel, the operational piece. Um, the infrastructure the infrastructure man mm -hmm. you're right and then and then more importantly man just the relationships uh, you know it's like G I always tell G man you ready for the big platform mm -hmm. you know but it's a process you know you know G know he's ready you know but it's just a process um, and the same thing with me you know I know I'm ready you know but I have to wait I'm not gonna speak on it mm -hmm. you know and I know a lot of coaches always tell you man I know I'm ready I know I'm ready but it's more to it Yep. Um, moving over six inches in the head coaching seat comes with a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and um, it you know guys think it's a cakewalk, but it's not, because now you're responsible not only for the student athletes, but for your assistant coaches. Yeah. Because those guys have families also. They livelihoods in your hands. They livelihoods, man, and 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 I always tell it, man. You know, man, when I get my chance, you know, I always want my assistant coaches to feel like brothers. I'm talking about, man, I want to go eat out with you. You know, I want to know your family. Mm -hmm. um, I want you to know my family. 
you know, I want us to feel comfortable enough where we could be family. I don't never want a guy to feel uncomfortable around me mm -hmm. at all. I get a shirt off my back. That's just me. Uh, but I want you to be honest with me. Um, you know, and that's how I, that's how I roll. That's how I move. Uh, you know, I'm not a big circle guy, uh, but I'm cool with everybody. I respect everybody. Right, man. If you if you call me and I got you, man, I got you. Uh, but um, you know, a guy knows when he when he's ready to be a head coach. Um, G just put me on the spot. <laughs> uh, you know, but um, you know, man, we we know that me and AJ has have this talk, man, a lot. Uh, and he always tell me, man, you ready. Man, you've been ready. You know, I'm watching you. Uh, but I always tell him, man, just the situation got to be the right situation. You know, and I I even say, you know, to be assistant coach on the D1 level. I mean, I know I'm ready. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but like I say, preparation got to meet opportunity. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you know, you know, that come with timing. Yep. You know, that come with timing, man. But man, I love where I'm at, uh, you know, and I get my chance. Coach Williams will get his chance also. Um, you know, and I say that, man. I truly love where I'm at. Xavier's a special place. Uh, you know, just seeing kids like us succeed. Mm -hmm. You know, bridging the gap, man. And I know, man, when I came up, you know, I couldn't understand that. But now I understand. So I go back, you know, signing Wayne Randall Bache from this. Mm -hmm. You know, a kid ain't never really been on Xavier campus. Uh, you know, you know, possibly, you know, man, a Division One kid. Yeah, yeah. You know, having him sign with Xavier was big. Mm -hmm. um, so that's it. And and I, I asked that question, and it wasn't just for you particularly. Just a lot of different guys that I'm friends with in the business. You know, you got some that doubt themselves, right? And you got some that's overconfident, right? And thinking they they ready to be a head coach. And so I just wanted you to touch on that because, like you say. When you six inches to the right, <laughs> and you in that head coaching spot, it's a little different. A little different. It's just a little different. It's a little different. <laughs> but G, I'm gonna tell you this, man. When you when you treat your assistant coaches or your staff like family, man, it's not even a job no more. Mm -hmm. It's not. Then you start seeing all type of success. Yep. Because it rubs off onto the coaches, to the players, to the managers. Sure, even to other, to other programs. Yeah. Um, you know, man, me and AJ, man, man, our relationship, it just rub off. And um, you know, man, is is man, that's what it's about. That's what it's about, man. But speaking on that, because you started out, your first coaching job was BRCC, right? BRCC. What was the ties with you and Coach AJ, how he got you to see? Man. Gee, man, we could talk for days. Man, I got <laughs> stories. Um, we had a kid named Mary Thomas. Mm -hmm. um, called a lot of schools about him. And, you know, everybody was kind of skeptic on him. Say he was an in-between guy. Mm -hmm. He was 6'6". He was from Tampa, Florida. You know, he was an inside out. I'm like, look, y'all, I'm telling you, this guy averaged 15 points, 12 rebounds. This guy could play. I seen him, you know, kind of, man, just one man show, man, dismantle you know, Mississippi Jucos. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm talking about high-level players. And um, Coach Les took the chance. But Coach AJ can't recruit him. And I'm like, Coach, man, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know if you could get him, but you could get him. And uh, Coach is like, well, man, I want him. I'm like, Coach, I don't know. <laughs> so make a long story short, they didn't get Eric. Eric wound up going to UNO. When in conference player of the year, mm. went to the tournament. Coach Les had a lot of success with Eric. And that was my assistant coach. And I, you know, gave him the Sless. Right. And <clears throat> AJ wound up leaving, taking a head job at Harry Stowe. Yep. So me, Missouri. So me and Coach AJ had a brief stint. And Dan Jackson called my head coach named Eric Wilson. He's not an active head coach at Winston Salem State. Right. right now, he just got active maybe like a month ago. And um, Dan was like, man, I love your assistant coach. You know, would he be open, you know, to come interview for the assistant job here because A.J. left. So I went there, and he was like, hey, man, can you guarantee me a player? So I'm like, yeah, man, we could bring Seth Jackson on, coach. 
So we brought Seth there. So he wound up hiring me. And um, to make a long story short, Danton left, went to UAB my first year, yep. and AJ came back. So that's how we wind up managing coaching together. Damn, that's crazy how that how that all came back full circle. Crazy. He's trying to recruit man. a kid, couldn't get him. He take a job, then bring you on, and then he leave, and then AJ comes back to Xavier. That's crazy. Come back to Xavier, man. That's why you got to treat people right, and yeah. that's why you got to do things the right way. Because mm-hmm. just think if you would have – Handle that whole process wrong with Coach AJ. When he got the job, you'd be like, man, I don't want this dude as my assistant. Right. Man, you got to say that again in the camera. <laughs> like, for real. You got to do what to people? You got to treat people the right way, dog. Treat and people that, like you want to be treated. And exactly. that's, the, that's, the, that's the biggest thing in this business. Um, and like I say, man, it's, it's it came back full circle. Um, and you know, man, I'm going to tell you a crazy story, man. It was AJ or Dante Jackson for the head coaching job at Xavier. Didn't know that. So Dante Jackson was at Stillman. Shout out to my guy Dante, man. Just seen him at the Mall Monday event. Mm-hmm. Um, and AJ wound up getting the job. But let me tell you how God worked. A year later, Dante get hired by Gramlin. So that job wasn't meant for Dante. Right. And now Dante here is Louisiana Coach of the Year. Mm-hmm. Went to the tournament. Yep. Man, success just blowing up. And um, so you see how, you know, what you're saying, how you yeah. treat people right and they come yeah. back around yep. and, you thing. know, man, your success, man, you just you just got to keep doing right. Yep. Coach Gio Ariana, you know, for the UK, for the, uh, uh, women's coach, um, he was on a podcast and he said something and, it, like, it, it blew my mind because I never thought about it. Um, and I just want to ask your opinion you know, because you had success with AAU, but you also played with Europe. And he said one of the reasons why the European players are better and more equipped coming into the league than your college kid, your your homegrown uh, United States kids is because in high school, the kid, you know, he he goes to AAU. He played like he'll play AAU games turn right around, play high school games, you know, do, do the whole circuit deal. He said, in Europe, they have practice like a week, play one game. Yep. Practice, play one game. He said, so they building the fundamentals. They working, they, they working all the stuff they working at, and there's a lot of stuff that games can't, you know, you can't build yeah, on. Right. And I just want to, you know, you know, like, what's that perfect balance of you have to practice, but – also, this is the day and age or like this is how you get recruited and doing, especially if you had like a small school where you don't, you're not going to get a lot of shine or whatnot, but the AAU circuit is what blowing it up. But like how to, how how is a kid supposed to build their fundamentals the right way? With, with all those games. With, with, it's, it, you know, High school team camps, AAU games. Mm-hmm. It's a lot. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you this, man. You go, you're going to make time for what you're going to make time for. You know, whenever we grew up, you know, I'm, I'm assuming we grew up in the same era. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we worked hard night in, night out. You know, if AAU practice was over with, we going to work on our game at the local park. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and when you work hard like that, something good usually come out of that. Um, and I know the kids are, you know, they're getting a lot of wear and tear, you know, with all these games. But, you know, at some point in time, you got to work on your, you know, your individual skill set. Um, you got to take an hour out of your time, whether that's sacrificing getting getting up in the morning, which a lot of guys don't want to do. Mm-hmm. You know, we did that. Yep. You know, you know, six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning. You know, it only take you two hours to really work on your game individually, whether it's shooting, dribbling, or, or, or whatever. You know, it just take you. You know, you know, just a little time. You know, then you could go about your day. But a lot of kids don't want to sacrifice six o'clock in the morning. You know, they want to work out. You know, 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock. But, but by that time, you know, you got AAU practice coming up. Yep. So now you're cutting into your individual time. Yep. So you got to make some kind of sacrifice. And I know the way until, you know, it works on your body a lot, but you're young. You know, man, it was plenty of times that we played sports from 9 o'clock in the morning yeah, to, to 8 o'clock at night. Yeah, the street light came on. Yeah. And you only ate a honey bun from the yeah. store. And drank the whole, the whole spike. <laughs> <laughs> so... You know, you know, and I seen G, and I told him, I seen G, man, and I'm gonna tell this to G, cause I always watch. 
I seen G believe in a kid, um, the Lacey kid. Mm -hmm. And that always stuck by me. And I ain't never told you this because that's how I was similar. You know, I heard stories about the Lacey kid. Yep. I don't know him. I'm just speaking on what, you know, and I say, well, G sticking by him. Yep. And now look at him now. You know, it just takes that person, you know, to hold you accountable. You know, whether it's getting him up at 6 o'clock in the morning, G calling him, hey, man, go run, man. Go run some routes. You know, you know, man, my cousin is, is at LSU, Corey Raymond. Okay, I know um, he's He man. is from New Iberia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New I yep. That's my dude, man. And, um, dude. Yep. And, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's, you know, man, it's, and I, you know, man, I always attest to that, man, that, you know, just believing in a kid and holding him accountable. You know, man, these kids out here kind of driving their own vehicle. Yeah, man. Making their own decisions, running their house. Running their house, man. So if you ain't waking the kid up at 6 o'clock in the morning and they want to work out when they want to work out, then they ain't going to never be with it. They ain't going to ever get what they want to get. Mm -hmm. But how do you, I guess, and I'm, 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 I'm asking this, you know, for, for, for the people that, that's, that's watching this stuff, from a basketball standpoint, how do you know what to work on that, Individually fits you. So, like, for instance, like if if we out at a foot, if we had a football field or something like that, and we throw the ball, and we see a kid naturally catches the ball over his shoulder and all that stuff. All right, well, this is the next progression to this. This is the next mm -hmm. progression right. that we can see that. But then, I just take your your Northwest situation. You came out the womb knowing how to score. Scoring, right. you do that back, you know. Mm -hmm. But now I need you to facilitate. Wait, hold on, I score. But like, but understand like as a coach now, it's like understand the big picture. If you if you know how to score yourself, you should be able to set other people up right. to score. But they don't see that picture. Well, it's a base, man. Everybody got to have a base. You got to be able to dribble, pass, and shoot. That's all the fundamentals. That's the three fundamentals of basketball. A lot of guys like to skip steps. A lot of guys like to do the James Harden step back mm -hmm. and all this and that before they know how to dribble real well. So every day you got to work on ball handling, stationary, movement, you know, left to right, crossover, quick, fast, wide, small, you know, in and outs, uh, you know, shooting the ball. You know, man, the mid-range is a lost art now. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a lost art. How many guys, and I always tell our guys, how many of you guys can make five pull-up jumpers going left and five pull-up jumpers going right in a row? Man, we had to practice that daily. You practice that before you shot a three. Mm -hmm. It wasn't no shoot, no three-point unless you practice your mid-range game. Yep. It, it wasn't no uh, going for a layup if you ain't not to jump off your right foot shooting with your left hand. Mm -hmm. So they taught you all that. Kids don't, they don't go over that now. So they don't have a base. So the progression of that is when I see a kid or if I'm recruiting a kid and the kid, you know, could dribble the ball, the next step is, okay, but well, can he shoot? Do we have to work on his shooting? Can he pass? Does he have vision? You know, all those things I check off. Um, and, you know, to make football, you know, to make, you know, to compare the football, if you have speed, you can play anywhere with football. Mm-hmm. So with basketball, if you can handle the ball, you can possibly play anything. You know, you know, you could do anything. You know, because you got control of the game. Yep. You're a very good ball handler. So that's the analogy to that. You know, you know, that's football, perfect. speed kills, basketball, ball handling really controls everything. Yep. Yep. And I, I never heard it placed like that before. Now, today is the NBA draft. I know it's going on right now. Uh, every the last. Three to four years, man, is is it's changed, bro. Uh, this year's draft, five kids from overseas is projected to go in the top ten. Yep. Two of them supposed to go one and two from France. Yep. <sighs> what's what's going on, man? Was are we are we about to have a damn near Euro League in the NBA in a sense? That's that's what we going like the what? the 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 USA basketball players are about to start. Taking a backseat to these overseas guys? Well, what's going on? You gotta understand, man. What? And I hate, man, I hate speaking about this. <laughs> man. Put it in the best, the best way you can. Man. 
okay, where the NBA is the majority. Mm-hmm. I know he's yeah. You don't have the to say owners. It. Yeah. And um and no offense, like I said. Nah, no, you no. know, we just speaking real. Right. Um there's a lot of guys out there getting eighty to two hundred million dollar contracts. So you know how much changing with that? Mm-hmm. They just so it's just my evaluation, right? I just got a kid, Tulu Smith, preseason SEC player of the year from Mississippi State. You know, I recruited his brother. They got a draft party tonight. Mm-hmm. Um, should be drafted in the first round, at least second. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he gonna get drafted tonight. Mm-hmm. You talking about a guy that led the SEC in rebounds, <laughs> SEC preseason player of the year? I think about this, G. Five years ago, you think that guy was getting drafted? Yes, indeed. Because think about somebody like Tristan Thompson. Yeah, but I said no doubt. Tristan Thompson wasn't no high level score, but he, I want to say he led the Big Twelve in rebounding, and he was like second or third in the country in block shots, and he went lottery. So now you got two guys from France playing in a French league. Probably haven't been battle tested against the type of guys in the SEC, right? Um, the ACC, you know, Power Five schools. And they about to be the top two picks. One and two. And um, you got to think about this, man. Le- LeBron opened up a lot of doors and created a lot of avenues. What guys are, man, look, man, they bridging the gap. Mm-hmm. And now, you know, the NBA is a business. Mm-hmm. And... um. Hey, I'm trying to put my best way to put yeah. this. And, and so I was talking to Greg Monroe about this. A guy, Greg Monroe, who played in the league eight, nine years, something like that. Real well. Greg said, Greg, me and Greg was talking. He was like, bro, what Valentin is doing for the Pels, I could do that right now. Right now. But he's from overseas, so the owners are going to value the overseas players over somebody like me. He was like, bro, I can do the same thing. And I thought about him like, all you really could do what Valachun is doing. And there's no knock to Valachun. No knock to him. Not saying he shouldn't be no in the no, NBA. Yeah, no knock Just to- saying that Greg, you, Greg should have the same opportunity. You got so, the same skill set. Same skill set. So the NBA is employing, you know, where they guys, trying, where guys they who they grow. want to employ. Mm-hmm. And they, where they're where they trying to grow. And where they're business. trying to grow. And, um, right. But is that good necessarily for the, for the future of the game and for – I got you. It's not good domestic. <laughs> no, I, 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 no, I, yeah, you're right. No, you're right. That's the you right word. I mean? it's, it's not good, not good it's domestic. Not good domestic. It goes back to think about the question I asked Coach with um about the Gino Oriana uh, comment. Like, hey, they in their mindset, like they mindset, hey, these guys are fundamentally better than what's grown in the states. The 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 only diff the the one up that the the, the states got over there. We way more athletic than them. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing is, basketball is beautiful, man, wherever. Mm-hmm. Yep. Jokic comes from Serbia. I had a lot of Serbian teammates. Mm-hmm. They're, they basketball bred it. They tough. They play hard. I'm, I'm talking. High I'm talking, IQ. High IQ. Some of my closest friends that I still talk to today, Serbian guys, they could play. But they play the right way. Mm-hmm. And. At some point, you need that. Yeah. Right? Jokic is top five playing the league. Yep. Easy. But everybody know the way how Jokic play don't sell tickets all the time. So the guys that were selling tickets was Vince Carter. Mm-hmm. Sean, Zion. Zion. Sean Kemp. Tracy McGrady. Mm-hmm. Michael Jordan. Allen Iverson. LeBron James. The Flash. The, D-Wade. Shaq. So, so now you got to ask yourself, like, why are we going away from that? Mm-hmm. You know, do we want the NBA to be, you know, how it was back in the days? You know, or do we want the league to be to keep getting better with the oohs and ahs? Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, people was more intrigued with Jalen 
Jalen Brown. Mm -hmm. People's more intrigued with Jalen Jalen Brown offense and defense, but there was more intrigue of how he was dunking on Luka Doncic. Luka Doncic, right? Mm -hmm. Luka dunking on him, stealing the ball, yelling in his face. You know, man, Europeans don't do that. Right. Luka Doncic is one of the best Europeans ever. You what? saw what happened in that moment. Mm -hmm. So you know what sold tickets. Jalen Brown. You know what sold tickets. So is the NBA is a big business, man, and they're trying to captivate on the European guys. They're trying to get that money worldwide. Worldwide. And they're going to have a Euro League team in the NBA soon. I, I think so, too. You I think it's coming. This is my take on it. I think back to when the I can't even think of her name, when she told LeBron to shut up and just dribble the basketball. Mm hmm and like the whole that was Hillary Clinton, no, no, no. reporters. I think she was on. Um, she was like CNN or something like that. Like, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm what, sorry. What, yeah, you're, what, right, what, you're right. One of those deals. And for like a good like three, four years after that, it was man. LeBron has led this generation of athletes in the NBA to where they have the power. Where well, you never heard of. <laughs> You don't you don't hear Luca being that way. You don't hear Jokic being that way. You don't hear you know like I know Wimby just got in the, in the league, but even like go back to you know Tony Parker, Manu Ginobili, you know Kukos, like they just played just the They just excelled mm. in their role. They well, hushed you know their mouth and kept going. You didn't see them really speak on too many worldwide topics. And I, right. and I well, think you know why, this right? is their way to try to get power back from. Us, if mm -hmm. you kept what I'm saying, and balance it back out to where the good boys, quote unquote, well, is come and feel, and feel happy. Well, that that's that's true, but nobody never had to fight the fight. LeBron had to fight. No, and um, every night, then every twenty years, you man, they say that you'll get this special leader. Man, LeBron is a special leader. Mm -hmm. Now, Michael Jordan is still my GOAT. No doubt. But LeBron James is a special leader. So you got your special leaders that come along every 20 years. And he kind of wake you up. Hey, man, why are you doing this? Go get him. Go get Rich Paul. He could do the same thing he's doing. Mm -hmm. You know, those leaders are special. So now you got guys that if they had a certain agent, they wouldn't be getting no 60 million. Right. They be getting thirty million for four years. LeBron, he know the ins and outs. Like, no, you got to give him sixty. And that's what's bridging the gap. With we got more millionaires now, whether they work out or not. Would the guys stay three years with their rookie deal or twelve years? Mm -hmm. And now you bringing these Europeans in again. None of those Europeans went through what LeBron had to go through. Nope. Now, some of them can say, oh, man, we're from the Soviet Union, you know, and they broke it up, you know, with the Soviet Union war. And everybody, you know, they went through some tough days with wars and stuff like that. But as a young black man, I think we go through war every day. Yeah. Growing up. Yep. Especially in our neighborhood. So they don't understand what LeBron been through and how he's trying to wake his his people up. Should I say? And I hate speaking on this topic because it's a touchy subject. It's a it's a touchy touchy subject, and it's not my mindset. Right. You know. You know. I believe in you know man equality yep. you know, all around the board. You know, and I wish everybody in the world could think like that, mm -hmm. but you know that's not the case. Uh, you know, and that's why we're dealing with with right. what you're speaking about. Yeah. Now they good players. Mm hmm But you can't tell me Tulu Smith. Now, I know late first round. I mean, I'm not a GM, but I know leading the SEC in rebounds. Got to stand for something. I, I don't know if that, you know. I, so preseason player of the year. I think about AD. How AD had that that run. Like he wasn't. Mm -hmm. He wasn't. People forget that he wasn't the guy on that team. Until Only averaged 12 points a game. So what, Michael, it was Michael Kidd. Get uh, Michael. Kid Gildress, uh, Eric Blesso, um, um, Pondonese. Well, that was, it was talent. You know what I'm saying? Like, they was, was loaded. And then, 
But uh, they, they was like a modern standing. day. They yeah. was like a modern day UNLV. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. And look who look who the one that's still standing. But like he wasn't the one, and it was like had he not nah, had they would have been the ACC like because the ACC still as at the time was still a better league. But still, the physicality that the SEC played with. <laughs> That's the NBA. You know what I'm saying? And, and to be that small and all that stuff, and you had to, and his size made him play in the in the post. That's why he was able to. Well, I'm gonna give you a perfect example. You know, the Ant Man played at Georgia. Yeah. Yo. No, I ain't gonna lie. I didn't. I, I didn't. I didn't see this. No, but, but I'm saying, you know, like the, like the like the level of play in the SEC. Mm-hmm. And you go back. What's the guy named from Duke that played for the Mavs? Lively. Man, that dude, yeah. I ain't even really know about the guy. Yeah, Derek Lively, yep. Dookie, baby. I'm a Dookie. I that, that guy came in there and mm-hmm. under Tyson Chandler. And mm-hmm. They brought Duke? Tyson Chandler in there to mold him. Mm-hmm. Him and Gofford. And he barely played that Duke, right? He played, but he, 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 he wasn't. He, he, was, he, was, he was the um, seven man in the rotation. Yeah, he played, but, but he wasn't. Like, but you see what I'm saying? He wasn't the guy for because, sure. Because he wasn't, because he couldn't shoot. Cause, cause they had Kyle. Yeah, four, rim he just liked Tyson Chandler. Yeah, pretty much. He just like Tyson Taylor. And he gave and he gave Al Hartford, who's probably gonna be a Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. You know, he gave him a run for his money. You think like, Al Hartford will be Hall of Fame? Yeah, definitely. No just, fresh just, legs. Just by his character, man. His character in the league. Um, team guy. Something like a Shane Battier. Yep. Um, you know, Al Hartford is a winner. Jalen Brown uh Jason Tatum said that's his favorite teammate all the time. I you know what I'm saying? I like like I just I just I just I just, I just didn't I wouldn't. I wouldn't think Hall of Fame when, when you when you think of Al Hoff. Yeah. Well, you got to go back to his Hawks days. No, no. I'm trying to. I like. I I get it. Like I know. Like you know, loan. I don't know if you noticed though, but Al Hoff made a lot of money in the NBA. Hell yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So so. Hey, you know, his team, his his college teammate, yo, Joe Kim Noah. Yeah. Made, but I, but made, I think he made more money than all of them on that team. Yeah, Brewer. Yeah. Cause yeah. Brewer, the and, assistant coach for the Pelicans. Yeah. And he, and he wasn't even the most athletic. Mm-mm. Skilled. Al Hoffa was just. I'm talking. About he got a. He got a couple hundred million. Oh yeah, yeah. He got paid when he was with the Hawks. The Hawks. Yeah. So you know, you talking about a guy like that. You know, under the radar, won the championship. Team guy. Mm-hmm. You know, they go do everything in their power to get him in there, probably. So. People like Rico Hines, John Lucas, Boo Williams. These guys have a big influence on. The young phenoms that's coming up, mm-hmm. and that's that's supposed to be ordained as the next, you know, lottery picks and NBA players that's coming up in the future. Mm-hmm. What do you think they need to do to make sure that our USA players get back control of what well, we are on top of being having eight USA players that's going t- uh, top ten in the draft versus eight. European players going in top eight, top ten in the uh, in the draft. What 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 you think? Because they have a lot of influence on the youth coming up. What they you do. think they need to do? Yeah, John to Lucas. Keep back def- control of this. John Lucas definitely have a lot of influence. Um, let me tell you, man, that's a that's a real subject. I think it gonna come out vocally soon. Mm-hmm. Um, John Lucas gonna speak on this year's draft. They say this year's draft is probably the worst drafts. Mm-hmm. Um, but John Lucas gonna speak out on it because he's a guy that. You know that all around them kids, right? Rico man. Hines, Bo Williams, yeah. and he up front, and he go tell the truth, and they respect his mind. Um, I just think, man, you know they got to come together. Um, you know, we, we could talk about you know the Europeans all day long, but like you say, if the leaders ain't talking about it, mm-hmm. which I think it will come out soon, mm-hmm. uh, right after the draft. Yep. If not this one, the next one. You know, if they continue having Europeans, you know, lottery picks. And it don't work out, then it will become a touchy subject. But when you got people like Luca, uh, Porzingis, uh, Rudy Goldberg, you know, I could go on and on about these overseas players that's making their mark in the league, and everybody trying to find the next one of them. But right. see, for for every one of those you could think of, I could think of a Darko <laughs> Miller chick. Yeah, I could think of yeah, oh, the kid right. from France. Dog. But they like, gonna hang their head on um, the ones Petrus, that did work Petrus, out. My, my, Dirk and the whiskey. Yeah. Like they gonna hang their head on see, the ones they can hang their head on. See, but the thing is, but it's a difference. The ones that they real like, uh, Luca might be the highest one, drafted one mm-hmm. out of everybody you just named. Jokic second round. 
Dirk late first round. You know, um, Rudy Gobert. I don't know where he went. He like so he might have went like you know like late second round. Like none of the the top tier were like lottery picks. Mm-hmm. So like it's like the for and that's for me like the lottery pick ain't where you find the value unless you know the Lucas and all that stuff in the in the overseas. That late you talk about like that seventeen. On back second round, I think that's where you get to steal for your money. Cause they yeah. like pages second round. Um, uh, he he Turkulu was like yeah. a, was like a yeah. late first, like yeah. was that seven that seventeen. Yeah, just so, yeah like second seventeen. Tony Parker, you know, like they all in that realm. Yeah. So what uh, what what the GMs understood back then that it wasn't a big risk, right. so they was taking those guys. You got so, high for a couple of years. It was taking those guys true. second round, late first round. But when you talk about a lottery pick, you're talking about a franchise player. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's why Darko Milicic didn't really work out. I had a teammate that was best friends with Darko Milicic when I played overseas. And he said he couldn't he couldn't really – he loved it, but it was too much pressure. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know – And it took him over Carmelo. Yes. And I think they're not used to that. You know, I don't know about now, but back then – you no, know, that was a different ball game for them. You know, coming in and being a face of a billion dollar team. Yeah. You know, that's a lot of pressure. That's that's crazy how I just think about because like me and G the same age. I, I think like you like just a little bit older than mm-hmm. us. Man, when NBA when we was watching the NBA growing up as kids, Vladdy Divac, Pages, it's a bonus. It's a bonus. Deadless shrimp. Deadless yeah. shrimp. Mm-hmm. That was Tony it. Kukoc. Tony, Tony, Kukoc. T- t- Tony. Like that was it for into like the Spurs had that magical team, and and like they started, you know, like you see, like they had like seven like overseas players on that team, and now it's like I can't name a team that don't have an overseas player. That, and like in multiple where like they might it might be a fifty. Like you look at the rosters, like maybe like fifty fifty. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm I'm give you an example too. Back to college, you know, some of my teammates coach kids now. You know, my former teammates in Europe, and they send me videos all day, six nine shooters, and I'm like, man, they ain't gonna make it here because, you know, we play up and down. You know, they got a guard too. Yeah. You know, so it's a different style of play. So it's like a gamble. You could know, you, you could know. y'all recruit a kid from overseas? Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, like, like how, like how hard you think would that be? Like, like, like to get him, like to get that six nine, that same kid you talk about, six nine shooter, get him in your program as a freshman. That could be a potential. Well, you know, you know, you know, as the level goes up, you know, you get these elite players, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we had a kid named Amade Koulibaly. All right, he was from France, Paris. He was six nine. Could shoot the ball, man. Played his back to the basket. Great kid. Came to Xavier, man. He struggled. He struggled with athleticism. I'm talking about he had footwork out this world. Could shoot the ball, pick and pop. And every time we'll give him good minutes, he just couldn't, you know, he couldn't de- defend. And he had trouble with athletic guys. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, man, how can we keep him in the game? How can we hide him? Can we go zone? Mm-hmm. You know, do we always trap the ball screen with him? Kind of get... So, you know, it was always like a like a scheme, you know, for him to be better, which is, mm-hmm. you know, coach's job to do. But, you know, you're talking about the NBA, I'm just going on a bigger scale, you know, or you go to high-level college guys. I don't know if I can name five Europeans off the top of my head you know, a power five school that's really dominating. Right. I can't. So I don't think they're sending their guys to power five universities no more. They just tell them to stay in these pro leagues mm-hmm. and you will get drafted off your potential. Mm-hmm. Because if you go to college, they're going to expose you. Mm-hmm. So now you're starting to see a shortage of high level European college players. Because they started coming at one time. You started seeing some guys. But then it kind of Twitter down and they told him hey just stay over here you know killing your league and then maybe you'll get drafted off your potential I'm gonna tell you something else that happened I remember talking to Rick Patino on the uh on the Under Armour circuit a few years ago and that, I think this is like 
when he first got the St. John job. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to him about, because, you know, he was known for going to get kids from Senegal mm-hmm. over there. And I and I was just very curious to know, like, man, how you how you was able to go get these kids from from Senegal and Africa and stuff like that, like the Juan Palacios and the mm-hmm. Gorgie Jeans of the world and the mm-hmm. Francisco Garcia's. And, yeah. You know, he went, he was known for going to get these overseas guys. I was like, how were you able to do that? He said, man, uh, he was able to build a relationship with guys overseas way back when, when he was coaching with the Knicks. Mm-hmm. And he said... Like the professional players or like the... No, I'm saying like he he was finding these kids like when they was like fifty, you know, overseas they'd be in the pro league at sixteen. Yeah, yeah 15, that's what I'm saying. 16. Like like he like the for the Knicks, I was trying to see where he made the, the connection from. Like when he would he told me when he was coaching with the Knicks, he started building a relationship with a lot of people overseas. Okay. And back then, if you if you go back and if they pull up some clips right now of the draft in ninety seven, and uh, what's the guy Jay Billis and uh, I forgot the other guy that that does the draft uh analysts, but. They would always ask them. They'll have like if you remember, like the they have like maybe like one or two clips. Yeah, some of them they ain't have no clips mm-hmm. back then in <laughs> the nineties. They just had a picture of them. They have a picture mm-hmm. of them. They might have had one or two clips if that, and they had a picture of them. Mm-hmm. And they'll ask them like, "What you know about this kid?" I don't know. Uh, this guy I talked to that's over there. He says he can shoot. He can do it. It was always he say she say. Well, now everybody just going over there. People just got access now. To get over there and go really watch these kids, and so that's why I think you're seeing more people vouching uh, about the you know then social media that then yeah. played a big dynamic into this because now they just posting them and now you can watch clips and streams mm-hmm. of these kids overseas and so now you've been having more access to seeing what they could do now and I think that's played a big part into why these overseas get guys are, are getting more exposure and why they getting drafted. I think this might be the first time in history that two guys went one and two. Yeah, that's true. yeah I can't, that, I can't and, think of it. And look, man, we, man, I was playing in Romania, man, so we played a team from Hungary. I was on a Euro Challenge team. So we were going to play different teams in different countries. And um, they had a guy named Adam Hunger. Mm-hmm. Man, he was Hungarian, but he was mixed. He was black and white. And uh, we playing him. The team played, I think, was Charles and all. It was like a Euro Challenge, Euro Cup team. And I keep hearing people saying, man, this guy going to the NBA. I'm like, who? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like him. I'm like, him? I'm like, no, no way. So I'm like, oh, okay, cool. You know, the guy got some game. He was on a national team. He had a good, um, you know how they do like the European games. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, he had a good showing in that. And man, that year, I forgot what year it was, but you could Google it. He got drafted by the San Antonio Spurs in the second round. And I was like, what? But that go to show you, like, like you was going by with video and film and GMs or scouts coming across the seas and see these guys. And, you know, they tell those guys, don't go to college there. Mm-hmm. Stay here. They go draft you off this league. You will be more comfortable here. You will average way more points. Mm-hmm. You will get paid. And they go draft you off your potential. Yep. I, I got a question for the panel. Since it's draft night and all this stuff, what lottery pick that you was most disappointed in that their NBA career didn't turn out like you thought it would? Cause I, like, I know just about, from the past? Like, yeah. yeah from the past. So my, mine's is Jonathan Bender. Oh, that's, that's a good one. I thought because like when because like because like they they put him like you know he was coming in they uh, the Pacers that just got Jermaine O'Neal and like I was like man this kid was in high school I'm like man he about to yeah. cut up and there were a lot of injuries in the NBA yeah. too. Uh, <sighs> I know one of mine's that favorite player one of my favorite players of all time T.J. Ford uh, got the spinal cord injury yeah I wore number eleven in high school because of T.J. Ford you know him and Dan Ewing was. Yes. Teammates in Houston, they lost two games in, in four years. Yeah, four state championships, bro. Yeah, it was good. It was, it was incredible. I, I followed him all the way from high school. I was like a TJ four. I was a, huh? yeah. I was a, like a a serious like high school fanatic, like just following all the top people in the country. And he was small, so I gravitated toward it. Mm-hmm. Couldn't I couldn't jump like that? But <laughs> uh, I followed him all the way to Texas, and uh, 
he was. I think he got picked. Ele- he got picked. That he picked. The Bucks picked him at eleven. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, had a good rookie year. Had a good couple of years, and then he had the spinal cord. I think he was going up for a rebound or whatever happened on a fast break or something, and he fell down on his back, mm-hmm. and they had to carry him off on a stretcher. stretcher. Yeah, and then he came back and played with the Raptors, but he just wasn't the same. Uh, I thought T.J. Ford was going to be a Hall of Fame point guard. Right. I thought he had that kind of talent, IQ, yes. competitor, Isaiah athleticism. Thomas. Isaiah Thomas type. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and so that's probably my – my. if I had to say my most disappointing lottery pick, it would probably be T.J. Ford. Like, I think mine would be Penny Hardaway. He had a good one. I mean, Five-year run? I yeah. mean, I, don't, yeah. I know, but injuries, but I just – man, Penny Hardaway was like – yeah, man, you, I was. You never penny, seen nothing like that. I was a penny dude. I'm out of my game at the penny, man. I had a haircut like penny. Yeah, <laughs> I had all the pennies. I'm, look, man, I was a penny dude. Still to the day when he came to Xavier two years ago, like I met him, like man, we talking for the first time, and we were just talking, man. And I'm like, man, man, you don't even know the impact you had on kids. Mm-hmm. Penny Hardaway, and if it wasn't for injuries, I know that. But early in his career, I, I just thought he was going to do a lot more. Yeah. Even though he did a lot, I just I just knew that that they wasn't going to get swept by Houston. Right. Um. You know, I just you know I don't know. To me, I just think Penny was was on a level with Kobe Bryant. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he was and, definitely on his way. So you know, man, for me, every time I, you know, you be on these. Twitter and you see these clippings of highlights and all this, man. When I see Penny highlights, man, with the little man with the little Penny, mm-hmm. man, it's like I want to drop a tip, man. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And 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 I didn't know nothing about Penny Hardaway coming out of college, man. I I didn't know yeah. nothing about it, man. I'm telling you, I, I used to watch college basketball hard. I didn't know nothing about Penny Hardaway. But then I start going to his background. Mm-hmm. So you know, Penny Penny was a street dude. Mm-hmm. I mean, he he wasn't no troublemaker. Yeah. You know, but Penny got shot. He got shot in the foot and all. I'm like, man, like, man, this could be me. Right. I can relate to this. You dude. know, so I'm like, I'm like, man, Penny Hardaway was like, man, nobody couldn't tell me no wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, but you know about Penny Hardaway. I remember we did. Um, G had invited us to um, help him uh, work the Super Sixty and Team Dez. Uh, uh, Thad. Dad. Oh no! no team, team Dez. Dez, Dez right? Team, Dez. Team, that's that's Dez his partner that died out of Memphis. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he um they came and like they had like they had a, a kid that did real good and man he talked like the coach like man he just sat there and talk about Penny and like like this Penny is coming back and he's doing all this type of stuff and you could just see like like all the kids like like yeah yeah Penny Penny but, like it was like man you don't even know how good. Right, the guy. Oh man, was yeah, man. yeah. Shaq is my favorite NBA player of all time. Right, you know, so hit him with the boom, boom, baby, and yeah. and I just, <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just knew that MAG team was gonna get one. Yeah, man, I just yeah. knew they were gonna get one. But it's just like Shaq told Jalen Brown, they got caught up with who team it was. Right, and, Go, and he, he, he was worrying about Penny was getting all the commercials, and you know, at that time, bro, Penny you know, had his who, shoe. Mm-hmm. Penny had a shoe. <clears throat> Shaq signed with Reebok. Yeah. He, he talked about how his agent made a mistake doing that. So, you know, that, that, they were young and dumb. They were young and dumb. Uh, I do want to ask you this, man, before we get into Coach Mitch's favorites. Okay. Um, man, what's the t- talk? Talk about what's the pros and cons of going to play overseas, man? Because I think a lot of kids, uh, good question. They are reluctant to go play overseas. Matter of fact, I've been I've been trying to get AJ Rainey over there, man. Oh uh, man, he refused to go get his passport. I hope yeah. he watched this. Yeah, well, AJ Randy, man. So I know he, AJ. So what he doing? Just he just working at home, bro. Just working at home and playing in these little dog leagues and killing everybody. Yeah, <laughs> I know AJ Randy, man. Actually, I met G the same day I met AJ Randy. Mm-hmm. AJ Randy was a year behind Ray Sean Mart. Yep. I know his dad. I know his brother. Yep. Um, great man, great kid. Um, I wanted him at Xavier, um, you know, and but you know this overseas thing, man. Is first of all, I'm gonna say, man, you got to be humble for whatever you get. You got to build. 
So I'm going to go back to college and I'm going to talk on this. You know, when I was at BRCC, I only made $120 every two weeks. Lord. But I was fresh off playing in Europe. So I didn't have no pride. I still don't have pride. You know, if basketball don't, coaching don't work out, man, I'll go drive a tractor. <laughs> you know, I'll start a lawn service. You know, I'll come help y'all. You know? <laughs> you know, but, you know, it's just the passion. But, man, overseas thing, I think a lot of guys get caught up because now it's different. So when I played, you'll probably get a, you know, your first contract. Man, when I played, I can't speak for everybody else. Your first contract would probably be like 5000 you probably have bonuses. You have your own apartment. You have a car. You know, you have meals through sponsors. You know, at restaurants. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, maybe to the guys that sat on this couch, you know, before me, 5000 they wouldn't move for that. Mm -hmm. But I moved for it because I know it was life-changing. I took that money and helped my mama buy her first house. So that wasn't much to a lot of people, but it was, it, you know, it was a lot to me. And um, Randy and them got to understand, you know, when you go overseas and you're doing something you love, the money go take care of itself. Mm -hmm. So if Randy going over there, coming from any high school, you know, whatever he gets, you know, I hope he get 5000 or whatever. You may get 2000 You got to take that. And you got to build off that. Mm -hmm. You got to go up there, put the numbers up, and, and just build off it. Same thing I told Rayshawn Mart. Don't look at the money because you're doing something you love. As long as you're getting paid, it going to get better eventually. Just like a job. Yep. You do your job good, eventually you're going to get promoted. Keep elevating. So you got to go into that with that mindset. If you think you're going in there thinking you're going to get, man, 100000 in. And that's the man. story they hear. They hear, man, they over to make $120,000 tax-free. I'm like, bro. Whoever telling y'all that, no, that's that's for guys that. No, I'm gonna say that Mac the youngest said that's cap. Yeah, bro, that, yeah, like that be cap. some BS, dog. I'll be like, bro, I don't know who telling y'all them stories. That's for kids that's probably was national player of the year at Duke, <laughs> and they probably yeah. going overseas making that yeah. kind of money starting off. Somebody that leaving the NBA, yep, joined yeah. overseas. Two people that 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 we know that I know real good, Jason Williams and Lawrence Gilbert. Won championships overseas. Yeah, Jason Wayne was in Israel when yeah, I was you, out there. You know what I'm saying? Like yep. he didn't went to Utah, huh? Yeah, yep, went to Utah. Utah. That's Kevin yep. Forge's cousin. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Didn't get to that level until like he was over there. Let's see, Jason is three years older than, than me. He didn't get to that level. Maybe to like his fourth, fifth year. Easily. So yeah. to think that you getting there off top. Yep. Yeah, 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 man. And I'm gonna tell you, man. The only guy I know in New Orleans that could really say that is um, Bo McCall. Yep. <laughs> yep. And that's, that's a guy I think, man, you should, I don't know if you brought him on the show. Yeah, Bo's on him. Okay. That's my dude, man. That's my that's my dude, man. Great guy. Um, Bo is the only guy in New Orleans. EuroLeague, to me, man, he the best EuroLeague player to come out of the state of Louisiana. Yeah. And that's, and that, and that's no disrespect to all the great guys like uh, the great players like Randy Livingston, mm -hmm. uh, you know, household names. Um, but I just know Bo because I was out there and mm -hmm. I used to watch him on TV. Yep. And, uh, you know, you know, at one time he got the EuroLeague point guard player of the year. You know how hard that was? Yeah. So he got that over guys like Rubio. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forgot the guy that's in Russia that went to the NBA with the Clippers for a little while. Yeah, he talked about him on the show. I forgot his name. Um, not Fernandez, huh? No, Rudy played no, for not, Spain. Yeah, not okay, Rudy. Rudy played for Spain. But he played against all those guys, and he yep. held his own. Yep. And he's talking about a guy that that couldn't hit a jump shot. Mm -hmm. 5'10", 5'11", playing against Giants. Mm -hmm. And um, he the only guy I know financially. You know, I don't, I don't speak on nobody financially, but I know for a fact he made some real good money. Mm -hmm. So... What? How, how did you get over the language barrier? I know they got translated over that. Oh man, and that's just something. That, that's just one obstacle. Like kids be bringing up, man. I don't know how I'm a operate over there, man, and, and I can't speak their language. And again, man, coming from a small school like Northwestern, you're not exposed to a lot. So when I got the call and I got the contract, you know, I arrived to the airport in um, Bucharest, which is the capital of um, Romania. Man, a guy was up with my name on a piece of paper and I'm like you know man, I felt special mm -hmm. and I'm like ain't never happened to me before right, right. I'm from New Iberia <laughs> so they picked me up in a BMW X5 at the time 
I'm like, man. So at the time, my team owner, I played for Ram Gas, a uh, team that was in Medias. It was the oldest city in uh, Romania. It was in central Romania. My owner owned 85% of the gas of the Damn. whole country. Well, yeah, money. And the country was 20 million people. So when they came to pick me up, everything was good. And I I'll never forget this, G. When they came to pick me up, they brought me to a hotel. And um, it was like, we will come get you in the morning, but you can eat breakfast here, blah, blah, blah. Everything is taken care of. Nice hotel. So I look out the window, man, the next morning, you know, first time out the country. I'm like, oh, man, they have a store. Plus, they gave me like $500 in their money. They're like, take this. You know, that's yours. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, all right, cool. So I go across the street. So I, I go to the store because I'm seeing these people carry a loaf of bread like a football. Like, like a, you know, like bread. Right. I never seen that before. Right. So I'm like, well, I want to go across there. You know, I want to interact with the community. And when I went across there, the lady looked at me and did this. And she walked up to me, an older lady, and did this. Rubbed my face <laughs> and rubbed her hand. And I was like, man, what that's about? So, you know, the younger generation, she was speaking in Romanian. Right. And I didn't understand. But the younger generation, they had kids there and I asked them what she said. And she said, like, she never seen an African-American man in her life. So that was a culture shock, first of all. Right. Whenever, you know, as time passed, you know, the language barrier, I started understanding certain words. And um, and believe it or not, man, it's kind of like Latin language. Um, Belarus, I never got the use to that. Um, um, Hungarian, I never got the use to that. That's different languages. It's really hard. Um, Wales, man, um, Bulgaria, mm -hmm. that's like hard languages, you know. Um, but but the Romanian language was kind of like a Spanish language, mm -hmm. so I understood it, you know, a little bit. But it was hard on first, man, because I couldn't, you know, I was scared to drive because they drive real reckless. Um, you know, I was kind of scared to eat the food because it wasn't the same. The cuisine. Um, you know, I just stuck with, you know, with chicken and potatoes, steak and potatoes, <laughs> beef be and potatoes. Can be basic. And, um, but for the most part, man, I started to get it, man. I actually met Terrence Howard out there, man, at the airport. Come on, man. Crazy, the actor? You had the actor. Okay. Come on, man. Crazy story, man. Yeah. And the biggest thing about that, man, was, what well, the biggest myth was the Dracula castle. Uh, we wound up going to Dracula's castle. And I was like, man, blew it out, man. The guy was like a, I was like a, you know, like a little person. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to say that, but he he was like a little person. And uh, he was like a Robin Hood. So that was big for me because, you know, growing up in the States, they tell us Dracula is real. Right. You know, he grabbed people, drank their blood and all this. You know, <laughs> impales them with the you know, snake. Yeah. Know. So I dare they laughing at me. Right. You know, they was like, man, you believe in Santa Claus too. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, man. But that was it, man. Language better. It wasn't that hard, man. You know, I was driving everywhere. Um, getting around with stores and, you know, if I didn't understand something, I just point at it, uh, mm. you know, and that was it. Now we got to get into Coach Mitch's favorites. Here we go. Here we go. Favorite hoop all time, no matter what level. That I played against? No, just like your favorite hoop all time. No oh, Michael Jordan, man. Michael Jordan. Uh, of course, Michael Jordan. Favorite sneak all time. Man, I'm a sneaker guy too, man. I'll be seeing, I'll be peeping your sneaker. I'll be peeping, I'll be peeping. You know? Oh man, favorite sneaker of all time. I'm gonna bring you back. My favorite sneaker of all time is the Bo Jacksons. I ain't, I ain't have the Bo Jacksons. Okay. I had the Barry Sanders, but I ain't had the Bo Jacksons. And you know what? I'm gonna go two of them. Bat. Well, Barry Sanders was nice too. Yeah, I had the Barry Sanders. Bo Jacksons and Bruce Smith. I ain't have them either. Bruce, I ain't know Bruce Smith had a shoe. Ooh, you got to Google the Bruce Smith. I got to Google it. I got to Google yeah, it. Yeah, that was the... That Talking was, about the DN for Buffalo. Yeah, that was the ones, man. I got to Google it. I got to Google it. All right. Favorite rapper all time, no matter what no matter what era. Oh, man. Man, I'm a Wayne guy, but I, I, I got to go with Scarface. Ooh, that's a classic right there. I got to go with Scarface. I, I was raised on Scarface. Mm -hmm. Substance dad, right there A lot of substance Yeah my daddy loves Scarface Okay okay Favorite comedian all time 
Chris Tucker. <laughs> it took you what, what episode? What episode I'm, we on? That's, that's my first. It's, it's, what, that's it's my like first? it's like episode sixty. It, yeah. it took you. you it took, it took you episode, episode sixty. Episode one person say Chris Tucker. <laughs> Chris Tucker, man. Chris Tucker. Right I, told, I told you, man. Chris Tucker, hey, man. Hey, 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 I didn't say nothing wrong with him. You hate Chris Tucker. No, I didn't. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. No, 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 yes, you do. I don't like his funny. You don't <laughs> like his funny? It, 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 it just, the, I don't like Y'all lucky he went Muslim. I don't like the the, the, the screech of the man. Yeah, like that. Like, funny. But like, you know like, he's making the last Friday, so you go, you go enjoy yeah, him you, on this yeah. one. Yeah, but is, is he, he's still Muslim. So he ain't going to be the same. He just ain't going to curse. He just ain't going to curse. That's all. Bernie Mac, baby. That's that. Favorite place to visit? Um, other than New Iberia, home, um, Napa Valley. Okay. I've never been to Napa Valley. California. Wine, wine country. I've never been to Napa Valley. A lot of money out there. Man, man, great place, man. I'm going to be honest with you. Great place. A lot of money out there. Great place. G, if you, you know, whenever you have time, you have some friends, you know. Napa Valley? Yeah, man, you're going to enjoy it. You're nice going to enjoy it. Nice yeah, you're going to enjoy it. Okay. okay. Yeah, you go change. You go. Yeah, you go change the game. <laughs> down. Favorite coach of all time that made the most impact on you? Oh man, spotlight. Man, we gotta have to cut the L on this one. <laughs> um, G man, it's too many. Man, how I grew up, man, it, it, it took a village, man, to get yeah. me here, man. I'm gonna just give all of them their flowers. Uh, man, Dave Thibodeau, who everybody knows. From LSU, where everybody know Dave Thibodeau, and God rest his soul. Um, Nolan Hamilton, mm. Christopher Poulard, Scotty Borrell, Russell Minard, Glenn Fondal, Sean Jones, um, Mike McConaughey at No Western State, all time winning coach in Louisiana history. Um, men's side. Um, you know, I got to give, you know, Mark Schlesinger, I got to give him a shout out, man. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave Simmons, who's the head coach at McNeese. He was my assistant coach at Northwestern before he was the head coach at McNeese. Um, I'm going to give it to my little league coach, man, Ricky Chapman. Come on, man. When I was seven years old, man, Ricky Chapman. Put the ball in your hand? Put the ball in my hand. If you see this, man, I can't forget about, you know, I don't forget about nobody. Bro. You know, I'm a family dude, man. I gotcha. got it on my own. Gotcha. Toughest. Player you ever went against that, like when you got home, you was like, God damn, that motherfucker was tough to stay in front of the night. Jay, I want you to ask people that's in my era if you ever talk to Corey Webster, mm -hmm. if you ever talk to uh, Byron Mouton, mm -hmm. if you ever talk to Brad Boyd, mm -hmm. you're saying some names right now, boy. If you ever talk to Michael Clayton, uh, Marcus Spears. Now I go on and on. Uh, Clarence Moore, all those guys, all those guys in, in my era. They had a guy named Cody Gabriel. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you heard of him. I never heard of Cody Gabriel. He was from Rain, Louisiana. That's like Ron Lake Charles, huh? Ron yeah. Lake Charles. You guys, anybody from New Orleans around that area? I'm just being real. They might not be. I'm just telling you what it is. Right. You know. Cause a lot of people made it to the league, or you yeah. know, so they might say, uh, "Truth be told, Cody Gabriel, man, I want to look in the camera. God rest his soul. He just passed away two years ago. Was the best guy I ever played against. Committed to Villanova out of Rain, Louisiana. Can I share this story with you? Yep. Cody Gabriel went to Rain, Louisiana. Went to Rain High. Played AAU. Went to the Boo Williams tournament. Now, I don't want to say no names, but this guy was a top draft pick, went to Duke. Chris Duhon. They told me, no, Chris Duhon wouldn't even. <laughs> no, I, ain't no disrespect to Chris, but Chris know him also. <coughs> uh -huh. Chris know him also. This guy went to Duke, was a top draft pick, and, and he on TV today. You know, you. We, we ain't going to say no names. I heard Cody had 30 on him in a Blue Williams tournament. That's what I heard. Now, I don't know how true it is, but I believe it. Um, because of what you saw. What I saw. <clears throat> uh, he was Mr. Biddy. In AAU, he was demolishing everybody in the state. I don't care who you are. If you ain't heard of Cody Gabriel, you ain't telling the truth. <laughs> um, he was 5'10". Left Rain, Louisiana. 
Mr. Ross Swiss took him in at Saul Lafouche. Now, listen to me. This is how good he was. Went there. Or oh, they was going to win a state championship easily. It wouldn't even know. Wouldn't even know. Average like 30 at rain. 30 every year. I don't know. Went there. Did some misconduct stuff. Mm-hmm. Took a bus back to, to rain. And Mr. Ross was like, don't worry about it. Got him out of that. Went to Oklahoma to a prep school. Man, they was trying to save this guy. This guy was special. Man, I wish I had highlights of this dude. This dude was special. Left Oklahoma. They didn't even make it there. Damn. It was unheard of for a kid to go to Villanova from Louisiana. For other real? Than, other than Kerry Kittles. Mm-hmm. And this guy was 5'10", 5'11". Went back to Rain, Louisiana. Got in some trouble. Some big trouble. Wind up going to jail. Uh, got out. Start being in the streets. And, you know, the story kind of writes itself. Passed away maybe a year or two ago. But that might be the best guy. And I played against some dudes. I'm tell- I played against some guys. NBA guys through college. All right. this. I played against some guys. Cody Gabriel was the hardest dude I had to play against. And if he would have went to college... Man, he would have been all American. I guarantee you that. Damn. I seen him. I'm, man, look, I don't know who contested this because we on TV, but I didn't see this guy demolish everybody in Louisiana. From highs to lows. I, I don't want to say no names because <laughs> people start, you know, yeah. I don't want to say no names. I'm going to just say Cody Gabriel. Man, um, you know, unfortunately, he couldn't. Reach that peak, yeah, for whatever reason. But that's the hardest guy, best guy, most talented guy, could do everything. You know the Iverson move when he came out. Mm-hmm. I, I seen him do the Iverson move before anybody knew about it in Slidell, and, and then dunked on somebody. Mm. And this dude was five eleven. This dude used to have a following before social media. If social media was in, man, he had a million views on man on everything. I'm about to do my research on Cody Gabriel. Man, do you know Bland Homer? Played at UL. You know the Mouton brothers? Yeah. That won a national championship at Maryland? Yeah. Call it. One of the best kept secrets in New Iberia. I mean, in, in New Iberia. In um, Louisiana. It's from, from Rain. From Rain, Louisiana. Cody Gabriel. I guarantee you that. I'm going to definitely do my research I'm, on that. Best I'm guy a- I ever played against. Yeah, yeah. Man, this was a good podcast, bro. Uh, I appreciate you taking a, a time out your busy schedule, man, to come on here, man, and, and fellowship with us and tell your story. Uh, I think it was very, very insightful, and I think a lot of people that would watch it, kids, coaches, parents, whatever, they're going to they gonna get a lot from it, dog. Uh, I appreciate our relationship over the years, man. I know you're doing your thing. You ain't cool, AJ. Keep elevating, dog, and I know your time is definitely coming, man. We're going to speak that into existence. Man, I appreciate that, man, and, you know, I just want to, Tell all the coaches, man, around the state, man, you know, that's working hard, man. Keep working hard. Keep your head down. Uh, man, wish everybody the best of luck on this season, man. I know this stuff is hard. For real. Uh, it's a grind. Yeah, man, it's a grind, man. Make, you know, man, blessings to you guys. Man, I want to see this blow up bigger than what it is because um, it's on its way. Yep. Um, you know, you got the right guys talking, the right guys interviewing guys, man, taking time to interview guys like me. Yep. Um, you know, it's not just about the head coaches. You know, y'all taking time to get to know guys that's, you know, that's really behind the scenes. Yep. You know, putting them on special platforms. And, um, man, I appreciate y'all, man. And, and, and you know, man, I'm a big supporter, bro. Yeah, you, you got to promise that you're going to come back, though, man. I'm going to come back, man. I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back, man. I'm going to come back. And um, I really want to come back, man, with somebody else because I really want to. You know, I want y'all to ask them coaching things so we can kind yeah. of build off each other. Definitely, definitely, bro. And, and I think the biggest, the biggest word for today from this episode has to be relationships. Yep. Treat people how you want to be treated. Accept your role in that 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 relationship that you have with that person and cherish it because how you got hooked up with Coach AJ. If you was if you was in it day but yourself. It would have went left, yep. you know. Meeting Coach AJ, knowing the type of person he is, see, like it makes sense now why Xavier basketball Having is so, so much success. Successful. Yep, you know y'all. First of all, y'all keep guy first. You like without That's that, right. you can't go nowhere. 
too, y'all don't mind speaking up for the little guy and staying who you are. That was the hardest thing I had to learn as a coach. And like it's and I and I don't think people understand that coaching is coaching no matter how high you go up, how low you are. If you do it for the kids, nothing else will fail. Right. If you do it for the kids, nothing else fails. And I'm just I'm I'm happy to know you now. Um I wish wish y'all all the luck in the world and um prayers for, for y'all getting that first natural. For real, we're gonna speak at, it to uh, his man. Man. Um it's I just I just see y'all doing big things. I love to see our own mm-hmm. establish and stand firm mm-hmm. and be unapologetically their own in their environment and it does good for a young black coach like me to see other people that came from my scenarios like i'm from here i'm from a rural i the same story you can tell we could we could tell we had my cousin on last week you know he made it to the to the top you know what I'm saying come from the same 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 um situation but i think it's real good for the young men and our that we're mentoring to watch stuff like this because it's a lot of them that don't have male figures right. in their life until they meet a coach, mm-hmm. a mentor like G, somebody who I'm not asking for nothing but your best. Yep, yep, yep. man. It's important, dog. Yeah. Definitely important, man. Man, make sure y'all subscribe to the Fan View Live page on on X, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. And man, make sure you subscribe to the G Sports page, man. Give me the 25. 25K, man. 25. 25. Before 25. 25 before 25. Go rush, man. Come out and, and support us this year. Definitely, man. Definitely, man. It's G Sports, man. I'm signing out. Step Construction is here for you with a brand new offer. We now provide affordable storage sheds. Stop wasting your money on overpriced storage units and portable containers. Step Construction can provide you with a custom shed that will fit your budget and storage needs. So contact Step Construction today at 504-340-5809 for your own personal quote. Let us help you take the next step at Step Construction. It's that boy Fred, host of FanView Podcast. Tune in to the NOTN app. Weekdays, 3.30 for the FanView Podcast. Go to NewOrleansTalkNetwork.com to watch more episodes of FanView Podcast. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and watch.